welcome to Remote Sensing Essential course. Uh, today we are going to discuss uh, application of remote sensing in earthquake studies and this discussion is going to be in two parts because uh, it is a little lengthier, uh, but I am sure it is going to be very interesting. As you know that uh, remote sensing data is a generic data and that means it can be applied for various applications. Uh, including in earthquake studies. So, we have seen some examples of how a remote sensing along with GIS can be applied in water resources studies or uh, related with natural disaster or other things. So, in that uh, uh, continuation uh, this is of course, an earthquake is a natural disaster. So, we are going to uh, discuss this part. Uh, uh, some uh, some uh, input is also going to be uh, come through the GIS uh, though it is not exactly part of this, but in order to for in order to have a complete discussion, I thought that I will include little bit uh, application of remote sensing in GIS that is integrated application, but most of the application is mainly on the remote sensing data. So, this uh, application on earthquake related things is going to be in three sections, one is the landslides how uh, remote sensing data can be used to study the earthquake induced landslide. I am not going to discuss the normal uh, landslide which are occurred either uh, due to rainfall or some other reasons, but I especially I am going to discuss here earthquake induced landslides and also there is a as you might be knowing that there is a co seismic uh, phenomena and that is liquefaction. So, when earthquake occurs in a certain conditions when soil is sandy and saturated with water and uh, due to the uh, vibrations or shaking by the earthquake a uh, phenomena occurs which is called liquefaction. And that means that uh, for few seconds maybe 10, 20 or 30 seconds the soil starts behaving like a liquid and uh, if any building or a structure is standing on that then that might collapse. So, we will be seeing some examples how remote sensing can be used to map the liquefaction or liquefaction affected areas induced by an earthquake. And finally, in this application part of remote sensing, we are also going to discuss how pre-earthquake thermal anomalies can be detected employing remote sensing data, especially the thermal remote sensing data. So, these three things are there. We will be also seeing applications of little bit of SAR interferometry. Uh, though while discussing SAR interferometry, we have touched upon that, but uh, th uh, these two discussions are especially on the applications of remote sensing in earthquake related studies. As you know that um, Indian subcontinent or especially the Indian plate if I uh, more precisely uh, would like to call it, the Indian plate has been moving uh, since uh, you know 71 million years ago it was somewhere else as you can see in this map. And uh, then slowly, slowly uh, it has uh, moved uh, uh, to the current position. And this uh, movement is uh, still continuing and when it is uh, you know meeting with the Eurasian plate uh, which is in the top is shown here in the grey colour, then uh, this pushing or this migration or movement of this Indian plate is uh, creating stresses and along all along the Himalaya and some other parts of India and uh, time to time we get uh, earthquakes as well. So, as you can see that uh, this movement has also created a huge mountain chain that is Himalaya as well and also ocean ridge and other things as you can see here that ocean ridge has been also uh, created in the Indian Ocean and of course, uh, Himalaya has also been created due to this movement. And this is a highly seismically, seismically active region, especially part of Himalaya and uh, there lot of earthquakes keep coming. As you know that uh, uh, this is the Eurasian plate and Indian plate is moving, this is continental crust of Indian plate is moving, it is going basically uh, you know below the Eurasian plate and which is uh, creating not only the Himalaya along these uh, few well known faults are there but it is causing lot of earthquakes. 
and uh, this is a very, very famous figure by Roger Wilhelm and uh, based on his uh, research uh, he has uh, basically uh, estimated that uh, these different parts of Himalaya are having potential to generate earthquakes of uh, different magnitudes or rather great earthquakes above uh, near or above uh, 8 magnitude like here where you are seeing that uh, this one is uh, 8.6 so this area is having that kind of potential another area which is part of uh, Uttarakhand and Himachal is another having a big potential of creating big earthquakes. So as I mentioned that uh, Himalaya is a large part of Himalaya is highly seismic, seismically active region due to the movement of Indian plate and which is going below the uh, Eurasian plate and it is causing lot of earthquakes regularly. Uh, so uh, generally what uh, we are going to see is the, uh, the earthquakes which causes are having magnitude 6 and above including uh, you know ground intensities of more than uh, 6 uh, which triggers landslides and uh, critical reaches of hill slopes. And this we have observed in uh, several past earthquakes few examples I am going to take. Uh, as you can see in this figure uh, given by uh, Kiefer in 1984 and uh, on the x axis we are having the magnitude on the and on the y axis the distance from the epicenter basically is given. So, as you move towards higher magnitude and uh, what you find that uh, uh, you know lower magnitude having uh, even lower magnitude having a very less distance to epicenter can also bring landslides. But as we move on higher and higher then different kinds of landslide like uh, rock falls or slides, coherent slides or spread and flows all can occur and depending on the distance. But when we go much away from the epicenter like 1000 kilometers then we do not see any effect of any earthquake even earthquake of um, above 8 or so. But uh, if we talk uh, say uh, near say 10 kilometer then even uh, you know 5.5 uh, magnitude earthquake uh, can bring landslides in this region. So, this gives a uh, basically a, a perspective view about the how uh, this relationship between magnitude and distance from epicenter uh, related with landslides can, is seen. Now, I am going to take one example of an earthquake which is about the co seismic uh, landslides which occurred uh, between uh, during this uh, 29th March. 199 earthquake which is also known as the Chamoli earthquake. It has the magnitude of, of 6.3 and uh, this of course occurred in Uttarakhand and uh, uh, what uh, we are going to see here uh, through a satellite image and then interpretation also and uh, that uh, there are few patches which you are seeing like uh, I will be seeing the la you know blow up or enlarge part of and uh, these two boxes which are marked here and a few more landslides which you can see like this one and there are also landslides here, there are also landslides here. So, if we compare these uh, this image with the image uh, before the earthquake then we can uh, make sure uh, that uh, which are the landslides which are induced by that particular earthquake which occurred on 29th March 99. So, here are the uh, you know the pre earthquake image and post earthquake image and this is from our own Indian remote sensing satellite IRS 1 C and this is panchromatic sensor and uh, this is of course, pre earthquake image uh, of 26 March just that just uh, 3 days before the Chamoli earthquake of 29th March and the right hand image that is the B image is of 31st March 99. Uh, though if you if you recall the discussion on uh, our IRS uh, 1C and uh, repeat cycle you would find that repeat cycle is uh, not uh, really uh, the 5 days which uh, the difference which you are seeing here uh, in the time. So, because that uh, sensor uh, had the capability of steering that means the from the ground after sending signals the, uh, the sensor can be steered 
or will tilt it towards a particular direction. And this is what exactly done after this 29th March earthquake that uh, when a, a neighboring orbit and uh, the same sensor, same satellite was uh, orbiting, it was tilted little bit towards the same area which is acquired the image on 26th March. And then we are having just 5 days time difference images. So, one is pre earthquake image and another one is post earthquake image. And when we are doing this kind of interpretation one, one or two things which we have to make sure uh, before we attribute that uh, these landslides uh, which are going I am going to discuss further are really induced by that earthquake event or uh, they, there are some other you know reasons. So, what uh, uh, other reasons can be intense rainfall other reasons can also be a, a human interventions or road construction other. So, when these uh, two images we got we made sure that uh, uh, there were no uh, basically after checking the meteorological data and the local inputs we, uh, we knew that there were no rain between in the, during uh, these days and secondly there are no road construction or there were no road construction during that time when uh, these images were acquired. So, whatever the changes which we are seeing between these uh, two images having 5 days time reference must be induced by that earthquake event which occurred on 29th March. So, as you can see that uh, here in this area there were already some signs of slow failure, but nobody really noticed and when earthquake occurred what we are seeing a big landslide which you can see here. So, definitely we can after going through or checking the meteorological data and other inputs uh, we can attribute that this landslide which I have just uh, highlighted is induced by an earthquake event. Another, another area which we can notice is this one and uh, then again uh, the a large landslide has occurred induced by uh, Chamoli earthquake. Now, implying uh, you know we have also discussed in digital image processing techniques that uh, we can imply some uh, you know if I wish to call a advanced image processing technique and uh, can create uh, some uh, pseudo color composites using uh, the span data because we are uh, in order to uh, create a colored image you require basically 3 colors and you assign to red, green and blue or 3 bands which you assign to red, green and blue. But here in our case we are having just 2 bands one is pre earthquake another one is post earthquake band wise or electromagnetic spectrum wise both are panchromatic. So, what we did we assigned the uh, red color to the post uh, image and green and blue color to the pre earthquake image. And uh, when this kind of combination it is not neither false color composite nor true color composite. So, we gave a name is a pseudo color composite and uh, the, the advantage of this uh, pseudo color composite is this that pre both pre earthquake and post earthquake images uh, pixels are on the same image. And uh, whatever the red areas which you are seeing uh, for th uh, this region and this region and uh, some other regions are the changes in terms of reflection induced by that earthquake event which has occurred on 29th March and uh, this time difference between these pre earthquake and post earthquake images are only 5 days. So, implying this pseudo color techniques using this pre earthquake and post earthquake images one can very clearly demarcate uh, which are the area which have uh, changed though in those 5 days. Another important point which you would notice that there are areas which are showing just a uh, white color which I am highlighting here and uh, here also that means there were no changes between pre earthquake and post earthquake. And this is this is very important uh, uh, from a, a prevention point of view that means there were already some signatures or some signs of slow failure. And we will have a further discussion on this point let me bring one more example uh, of landslides from the same region induced by the same earthquake. Further uh, using this uh, pseudo color transformed image or PCT image 
and uh, by doing a one more step in the image processing that is masking rest of the things except keeping the red part we can exactly delineate the landslide affected region and this is what exact it has been done on the right side image. So, two major landslide which we have noticed uh, uh, Gagan, Gao and uh, Gopeshwar landslides and they were marked very clearly very precisely using this uh, uh, threshold value now or masking technique. Now, uh, another example uh, is again on the left side you are seeing pre earthquake on the right side you are seeing post earthquake time difference is again 5 days. So, before earthquake or 26th March after the earthquake 36 and uh, 31st March and remember the earthquake occurred on 29th March. Now, here uh, you are seeing on the left image that is pre earthquake image already existing some landslides, but this part has got a uh, new landslides and the uh, and also the existing landslides have enhanced. So, when we see this PCT image or pseudo color transform image this things comes very clearly that uh, red part are all showing the changes which has occurred during those 5 days that is induced by an earthquake event and white parts are showing basically no changes in those 5 days in the pre earthquake or post earthquake image. So, what, what the uh, lesson we can learn from here is that uh, there were already some signs of slow failure before the earthquake there were already some signs of slow failure and basically everyone ignored. If care would have been taken then uh, probably whatever the losses which uh, these landslides have caused to the humans and uh, agriculture fields and other things might have been avoided or uh, prevented rather. So, uh, that, that is the advantage of uh, remote sensing images that they keep recording the data after or, uh, every orbits and we know where landslide will occur and we also know where earthquake induced landslides can occur. We also know where earthquakes can occur. Only thing we do not know what magnitude earthquake will occur and what would be the timing or date or when it will exactly occur. But we know the earthquake or seismically active regions like this part of Himalaya. So, when we notice say, uh, some landslides and then uh, the care should have been taken uh, so that uh, the losses uh, can be uh, you know minimized. So, that that should be uh, that advantage of remote sensing should be taken here. One more example uh, uh, of uh, these uh, recent earthquakes uh, uh, let now it is of course, 2019, but uh, uh, in Nepal from earthquake point of view these, these are recent earthquakes of uh, big magnitudes which uh, 7.8 magnitude which occurred on 25th April and uh, 7.3 magnitude. So, first one is called Gorkha earthquake, another one is called uh, Dolkha uh, Nepal earthquake of 12th May 2015. And uh, these two uh, successive earthquakes have caused extensive landslides, more than 5000 landslides have been uh, mapped uh, in this area of Nepal. And uh, what basically you, here you are seeing the two earthquakes are shown as a asterisk or a star and the rest of the uh, uh, aftershocks or uh, you know force shocks which were occurred uh, during that time are also shown in red circles. So, a, a, in a one area lot of intense seismic activity has occurred in those uh, uh, basically 20 days. Uh, or less than 20 days and it has caused havoc in terms of landslide and loss of property and houses and everything. So, this is what uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the fault which was responsible was MCT and as you can see that uh, one earthquake which occurred here and uh, that uh, 7.8 magnitude earthquake and 7.3 uh, uh, earthquake these two has occurred and in between lot of uh, and different magnitude earthquakes have also occurred. As we know that uh, through this uh, uh, this Mount Everest uh, shrank as Nepal quake lifted Kathmandu and the ground near Kathmandu lifted vertically by about 3 feet. How this all information is coming? It is all coming through the analysis of remote sensing data. 
so lot of interferometry or SAR interferometry techniques were employed using different census data like a loss pulsar data or a, your a, a NVC data, sentinel data and people have analyzed extensively and could come up to these uh, you know conclusions that uh, the ground uh, Kathmandu area has vertically lifted by 3 feet is a large very large movement if you think in terms of earthquakes and as you can think that what it will cause it has really caused havoc as you can see the ground photographs taken just after the earthquake. So, this is a, a you know one of the main roads of uh, Kathmandu and as you can see that uh, the entire road has uh, split it in two parts and the another area which is shown here the complete road has got damaged. See the damage uh, these subs, uh, you know the vertical raising of uh, uh, this Kathmandu valley which has caused uh, uh, you know huge damage to buildings as you can see here. Uh, again some buildings again these areas as you can see here and uh, monuments and temples there were a lot of temples which we are also uh, damaged. Like here this is uh, called Dharahara uh, tower and uh, uh, see this is the remnants of uh, this tower and before the earthquake this was and uh, this minar was like this. So, before this uh, the temple was like this now it is like this and uh, before this and uh, this uh, whole temple area was like this and after the earthquake. So, every almost every such monuments uh, were damaged in Kathmandu area uh, because of earthquake. But uh, our purpose here is to discuss uh, earthquake induced landslide. So, I am coming and how a uh, time series data can be employed because remote sensing data is available regularly may not be from same sensor, but may be from different sensors also. So, we can employ this data. I have put all these images except the uh, bottom images which, which uh, we have taken from the ground itself just after the earthquake, but other images are the first four images from left are from Google Earth. As you can see that uh, this is 14th May uh, 2015 image and uh, this uh, after these earthquakes and as you can see this landslides and uh, this is called Bahra Vise landslides and uh, it, it has become really huge. But between uh, October uh, uh, 2012 and August uh, 2014 you can see that uh, there were hardly any landslide and uh, because of rain this landslide became of this much size. Now, another uh, co uh, landslide uh, you know induced uh, prom problem is another which occurred in Nepal during these earthquakes is that these many landslide have caused uh, or dammed the rivers and uh, this is what you can see here also that a new a dam was created a you know uh, you can call as a landslide induced dam and uh, these are very dangerous because in the upstream it will fill the water and any time these dam can break and in downstream they can bring uh, havoc in uh, because of dam break. So, that is another concern. So, what, what I am trying to say here through these uh, time series images that there were already some signs of slow failure in 2004. In 2012, uh, they, this, uh, those slopes have uh, now taken shape uh, as a landslides. The preventive measures should have been taken then in 2012 or li just little later, so that uh, this should not have become a large. Now, in 2014, though it became large, but a, after the earthquake, it has become further. So, this landslide has enlarged. So, this landslide started with a small you know movement of slope and induced by rain it became a quite large and after the earthquake it has enlarged further and further it has uh, damaged uh, damage or uh, damped the river and created a uh, problem here. Uh, just to give an idea how big this landslide was uh, this is the uh, human is standing here. So, you say huge landslide and road which was going to Barabise village is completely uh, destroyed 
and uh, then accessibility became a big problem. Now another example from Nepal earthquake, there is a pre-earthquake and post-earthquake images as you can see here that there were already some signs of slow failure, everyone ignored and uh, uh, earthquake has enlarged this landslide. We also visited on the ground and uh, by that time things were cleared on the road, but it became a large landslide as you can see. Another is a Dholaghat uh, landslide which you can see here and uh, Kodari was the epicenter of the first earthquake. This was also the road was blocked because of landslide, but later on it was uh, cleared. So, hundreds of such landslides have occurred in entire region. So, this is Chaku, Sindhu, uh, um, Sindhupal area, Sindhupal Chowk and uh, this is April 2015. Similarly, as you can see a large landslide has occurred, it has also dammed the river and this uh, uh, you can see that how it can create problems. So, this uh, uh, dammed lake or um, um, uh, thing uh, or uh, you know dam can create havoc in the downstream. Important point to note here that there were already some signs of you know slow failure or creep movement due to the drying up of the vegetation. And that was also a sign the slope in this area is about to fail. It was just waiting for some triggering effect that might be because of road construction, that might be a monsoon rainfall or that might be an earthquake. And what earthquake once the earthquake has occurred, it has really created a problem and it, it, this landslide has become very large. So, this is absolutely induced by an earthquake. Similarly, there are many many landslides, some are old, some are new which has got uh, uh, or some re uh, got reactivated. We implied the same pseudo color transform technique and a large area uh, in this uh, one wa could be we could map which we are induced by that those particular earthquakes. Uh, similar another example from the Nepal area. So, what do you, in this summary figure what we see here? These two earthquakes are marked here on the left and right and uh, there are some uh, uh, landslides which have been marked as the minor landslides. There are uh, you know major landslides which have been marked as blue color, but the important point to note here is that almost every these landslides are uh, north or on the hanging wall of MCT. And we could conclude or by looking such plots we can say that uh, that earthquake probably was responsible. Later on it was confirmed with some other studies that uh, that uh, fault was responsible for these two earthquakes or we can say the movement has occurred, maximum movement occurred along this main central thrust or in short we say MCT. So, about more about 5600 landslides have been identified in this area using pre-earthquake and post-earthquake images and also implying this uh, pseudo color transformation techniques. Major landslides of course are limited to the zone which runs east-west that is approximately parallel to the uh, transition between lesser or higher Himalayas especially all along the MCT. So, that is more important point. So, what, uh, what we can at mid stage what we can uh, say about that earthquake induced landslides uh, generally occur. Uh, this is a long term observation which we have seen in many earthquakes in Himalaya which are on the sun or south facing slopes because uh, most of the uh, land use concentration is on that part, human interventions are also and heating and cooling also uh, there on the south facing slopes. And these landslides uh, have been uh, the earthquake induced landslides are uh, have originated uh, near uh, or at the uh, ridge crest that is uh, top of the that uh, hill or mountain and uh, which suggests that uh, might be there might be topographic implications uh, which has might have played very important role. So, in most of these earthquake in these landslide this is one common observation which we have seen. Also that uh, landslide occurred in Nepal most of uh, these things as you know that we have discussed this part. So, I am not going to that 
and this is about the SAR interferometry. So SAR interferometry technique uh, was also employed in case of uh, Nepal earthquake. You can see the interferogram and you can see that a large, uh, large number of fringes that means they are showing a huge movement as we have said the 3 feet movement has occurred in this valley and uh, that uh, one can uh, really estimate very accurately using SAR interferometry technique. So, this is one of that example and uh, this includes only the first earthquake this uh, does not include the second earthquake. So, if we see a deformation map of that area, what we find uh, uh, of uh, this uh, later earthquakes of 12th May of magnitude 7.3 uh, that uh, the central part of the area has gone uh, by you know 70 centimeter towards the line of sight and the remaining area uh, is there of course uh, no subsidence has occurred ma maximum upliftment in this area has occurred uh, after this uh, induced by this uh, second earthquake. So, this is how the uh, entire picture comes uh, through SAR interferometry analysis that uh, a large part uh, in the Kathmandu area uh, gone uh, you know uh, some part has gone up like um, uh, peaks in the Himalayan range and uh, some part has gone down by 2 feet or th uh, 2 meter or 1 3 feet or uh, so. So, this is this kind of estimations uh, can be done using SAR interferometry technique. Now, second part is about liquefaction as I have discussed that liquefaction. So, this is a, a an earthquake uh, which really occurred way back in 1934 and uh, this has uh, this has caused uh, extensive liquefaction in Indo Gangetic plain and uh, it was possible for us uh, to imply uh, while implying remote sensing data we could map uh, even in in the images of 1972 onward that uh, liquefaction affected area induced by that 1934 Bihar Nepal earthquake and there were lot of large water bodies which were shown here. So, uh, though at that time the old Ham who was one of the very well known geologist of that time he recorded and uh, put in a memoir about this earthquake and uh, using that information and uh, the satellite images which made available after 1972 onward and uh, we could map. Uh, the liquefaction affected area induced by 1934 earthquake as you can see here. This is the area which we have mapped and if you uh, try to see the area uh, with the, uh, these isoseismals uh, you can come up with exactly where things have occurred. If liquefaction occurs like in case of uh, Nepal earthquake this is what you see that there are bends sand uh, you know comes out or water comes out from there and these uh, sand volcanoes kind of situation though the scale is not that big and uh, there may be some water bodies might appear uh, because of liquefaction. So, these observations made in uh, this April 25th, uh, 2015 Nepal earthquake. Another important application of remote sensing is now I am going to discuss very briefly in case of uh, Bhuj earthquake of 2001 of 26 January. Here again we employed pre earthquake and post earthquake images instead of visible images we employed here and the infrared images because we wanted to detect the uh, water bodies because whenever liquefaction occurs the water comes on the surface and that uh, may there might be some channels and this is what. So, this is again a pseudo color transform image as discussed earlier. And uh, when this was created, uh, what we find lot of uh, you know uh, water bodies or channels appeared, and uh, this uh, these images are just having uh, 25 uh, time difference. But the post earthquake image is just three days uh, after the earthquake. So in that way, it's a highly reliable image, and uh, we could exactly map. This is this has happened first time in the world that uh, implying remote sensing data the liquefaction affected area induced by an earthquake was mapped very accurately as you can see here and uh, this uh, uh, as per the intensity map of 
uh, you know the, the zone intensity zone 9 had the maximum liquefied area in this uh, earthquake. So, uh, these things now what lessons we can learn? One part is uh, analyzing the data, another part is interpretations and now real applications. Now we know in this part of the country that uh, earthquake can bring liquefaction. Luckily in 2001 there were not many uh, civil structures or buildings, towers or bridges were there in this part of the area where we are seeing the maximum liquefaction. After this earthquake lot of development has taken place and people have ignored this information that this area uh, is susceptible to liquefaction. So, if you create any structure civil structure bridge or tower or building multi story then care should be taken and those uh, uh, buildings should be designed which will incorporate the uh, this factor if, uh, if earthquake occurs if liquefaction occurs still they will sustain otherwise what will happen something like this. This is uh, uh, these are the images or the photograph ground photograph of 1964 Nigata earthquake of Japan and this is what happens in case of earthquake if you are having multi story buildings for few seconds the building uh, will be on in a liquid basically because the soil starts behaving like a liquid because of and uh, this uh, water which comes out and uh, therefore, the soil where the foundation of these buildings and uh, the soil loses a complete strength in it and anything which is standing is not in balancing position may topple like this as you are seeing here. So, this uh, uh, brings uh, the part one discussion and in this one we have seen earthquake induced landslides and what lessons we can learn second is about earthquake induced liquefaction. In the next discussion we are going to see as uh, indicated that we will see how remote sensing can be employed uh, using thermal uh, image data uh, uh, to detect pre earthquake thermal anomalies. So, we would be seeing a few examples of that in the next discussion for time being thank you very much.